And we are pleased to present, as you have heard, Merton from Jazz to Chant. Using the works of Thomas Merton and others, the Merton Institute develops resources for living your everyday life as your spiritual life. And this way of living is the essence of contemplative living. In No Man is an Island, Thomas Merton said, music is pleasing not only because of the sound, but because of the silence that is in it. Without the alternation of sound and silence, there would be no rhythm. If we strive to be happy by filling all the silences of life with sound, productive by turning all life's leisure into work, and real by turning all our being into doing, we will only succeed in producing a hell on earth. If we have not silence, God is not heard in our music. If we have no rest, God does not bless our work. These words let us peek into the world of Thomas Merton and see the role that music played for him. Thomas Merton enjoyed music and the silence between the notes. Before he entered the monastery, he frequented jazz clubs, and this continued after he became a monk. While in the monastery, Merton discovered chant, and tonight we invite you to enjoy two seemingly different forms of music, and at the end of this hour, you decide how truly different they are. So with that, I invite you to sit back and enjoy. Well, good evening. <laughs> I, uh, I'm Chuck Melnick, and uh, Brother Paul uh, Quinnett from the Abbey and Gethsemane asked me about this project and uh, wanted to know if I'd be interested in this. And of course, I was. I've always been a fan of Thomas Merton. As a matter of fact, I've been to the been to the Abbey many, many times. So it's actually going going all the way back to 1968. And a great fan of, 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 of Father Lewis, his, uh, his, his works, his writings. Um, when I first found out about this project, I, I started to think about it, and um, 
was particularly intrigued with the idea of finding a way to bridge uh, the, the, the music of, of, of uh, modal jazz, particularly modal jazz and chant. And there are similarities. As a matter of fact, the first piece that we played was uh, a, a very important piece of music. It was called So What? It was from uh, the Miles Davis recording of Kind of Blue, which was uh, which was really a, um, a groundbreaking recording, and many people would consider it to be the finest jazz recording ever made. It was really the very first att uh, attempt at utilizing uh, what we know as modal music, as opposed to just standard uh, music from Tin Pan Alley and the harmonic chord progressions and so forth. It reduces everything to one scale, and uh, so uh, Miles uh, Davis recorded this uh, this wonderful recording, and that's that was. Uh, so anyway, I started to think about Merton and uh, Father Father Lewis. I go, well, I'm going to go back now to the time when he was in college, and he was in his 20s. He was young Thomas Merton, and he was uh, at Columbia. And uh, there's a couple of things I think that everybody needs to realize. First of all, uh, uh, young Merton, and even all through his whole life, he was a great fan of jazz music. Jazz fans all have one thing in common, or several things in common. First of all, they will go just about anywhere to hear it. Once the word is out, they'll travel miles and miles to hear it. And if it's good, they, they, they absolutely adore it. They, uh, I've taken some, written some notes down here. Uh, they, uh, they buy records. What a concept. <laughs> they buy records. Musicians love that. Um, you know, back in the, back in the, in the, in the, in the 1930s, it was a, it was a, a different kind of a situation, a different time, you know, uh, particularly with with respect to the racists. The races, black musicians stayed with themselves, stayed among themselves, and the white musicians the same. Uh, I had the great pleasure of going down to the Abbey just a, uh, a few uh, uh, a few days ago, and I I uh, was given the privilege of going through the Abbey record collection, the jazz the jazz collection. And, of course, this was the music that Father Lewis was listening to. And it was a very interesting collection. There was a, but it, it, it goes all the way back into the 30s. And so, as a young man, he was listening to what all jazz, all jazz lovers and jazz musicians were listening to. They were listening to big bands. They were listening to swing music. Music by Tommy Dorsey, Duke Ellington, Fletcher Henderson, Benny Goodman. All these records are in the Abbey record collection swing bands, but there's an interesting thing that happened during, during the swing periods, particularly toward the uh, latter part of the period. There started to be uh, breakouts, uh, jam sessions, after the bands would play their gigs, and the musicians would, would go and they'd play in clubs until late out late in the evening. And, uh, and it's, it, it really doesn't take much of an imagination to, to, to envision uh, Jan Burton going with a bunch of college kids. I mean. Think about it, he was bright, he was interested in the arts, he came from a family that, would, that appreciated the arts, both his parents were artists. He'd been listening to music and, and appreciating the arts for a long time, so being in New York, by the way, which is still the hub of, of jazz and creative music in the world today, as it, as it was back then, and it will probably continue to be that. Musicians come from all over the world to be there, to play there, and to, and to, to learn how to better their craft. So, Jan Burton, you know, he was a student at Columbia, not too far from Harlem, just a little bit south from Harlem. So it's not too much of a stretch to imagine him going with his college buddies uh, up, up, into, or, or, yeah, up into Harlem and into a black club and hearing some really cool and exciting music. And I'm of, of, the, of the belief that he discovered that uh, that's something something very deep and powerful in the music. There was a, a, a vitality. There was a, there was a, there was a real spirit in the music, you know. And it, I think it maybe even may have opened up the doors to his own spirituality through I mean in in, in the musical sense as well. So he, he was listening to to hot music, musicians that were taking chances, were on the cutting edge of, of, of new and exciting ideas. 
And uh, by the way, Merton was listening to piano players, Scott Joplin, Earl Father Hines, of course he wasn't father at that time, he was Earl, Earl Hines, Art Tatum, Jelly Roll Morton, and so forth. Now I would like to give you the shock. A funny thing happened to chant to both Thomas Merton and myself. Remember the famous movie, Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum? Well, something happened in Gregorian chant in the 50s. In the 50s, Thomas Burton and I both shared. I'm old enough to remember the 50s. I was a monk at St. Myron in the 50s. So we sang chant in a very certain way. It was called the Salem Method, and it was propagated through books called the Ward Method. Some of you may even had some of those if you're old enough. And the Ward Method taught you that every note in chant is absolutely equal. It's equal in duration, it's equal in volume, and you count it off silently in groups of twos and threes. If you don't know how to count it, we'll put a vertical mark called an ictus, a little mark in there. And we could count every note, usually you started from the back and worked forward. And this, this can't, counting was some way to keep you together because it was simply, in my estimation as a young novice, one darn note after another. <laughs> and we're going to demonstrate that for you first. We're going to take the same piece you heard called the Poor Novices. We're going to sing it the way I had to sing it back in the 50s when I was a member of the St. Michael School. I'm almost certain Thomas Merton heard it somewhat like that. At least he heard it in that kind of style called the Ward Method or the Old Salem Method. And then I'll come back to the mic and explain what happened to chant, and we'll do it again in what we now call the new Salem method. Okay, we'll give you first the, the civil version. some studies done in Rome which I was privileged to participate in by a monk of Salem named Cardin, and he invented a system called semiology. Go study the original signs. Go study the director's markings on his chart. And you'll find out that only certain pitches are important and that the others are decoration. If you listen to your jazz people, you know that there's a basic chart they work from but then they are free to add improvisations around that, and they have a certain period of time to do it, and they play it back and forth. Well, chant had the same thing. Those characters who sang chant in 900 must have been jazz musicians of some kind, because <laughs> they certainly knew how to improvise around the key notes of a piece. So I think we better repeat the structure pitches again, and then we'll sing the full version uh, of the poor Poronatus in this new style. Thank you. 
that's happened in the performance uh, chant. If you do have other pieces, we'll have other illustrations later on in the program, but I'd like to turn them back now quickly to Chuck, because that sets the stage of what Thomas Burton and I both experienced in the 50s. An interesting thing usually happens, in, with, particularly with respect to, uh, uh, to the jazz community with, uh, of musicians. About every 10 years or so, there is a shift. There's a, there's a seismic shift. The, the creative juices, the, the muse, uh, gets, becomes restless and musicians start to look for other ways to express themselves. And uh, this happened in the 20s, from Dixieland moving to the 30s, to the swing year, to the 40s, bebop. And then the 50s came. Well, the 50s were, it was an interesting time because for jazz, uh, what, what had happened was the, in the 40s, the, the bebop era actually, it, it, was, it became a, uh, a time of, uh, of ultra-complex musical forms and reharmonizations upon reharmonizations, fast, frantic tempos, the, the, the demands on music, musicians were, were really, really quite formidable. Uh, musicians had to really be able to play their instruments very, very well. Charlie Parker, and he led the whole gang, you know, with Dizzy Gillespie and so forth. But uh, in the 50s, musicians got tired of all of that fast, frantic stuff and all of the it, it, became, it became almost like a, uh, I know because I was there, it became, it became a, a, a tiresome thing, reharmonizing on top of reharmonizing and, and coming, trying to find different ways basically to deal with complex chord progressions. Well, Miles Davis came along with the kind of blue recording and he ushered in a whole new era in, in the 50s that, that began uh, the modal music became very important in jazz. All of a sudden, musicians were playing songs that had one chord, two chords. How do you play on that? Well, improvisation prior to that was really a question of navigating through this complex maze of, 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 of chords. When you take all that away, what's left? What's left? We, they found was if you, stay, if you just take one mode, seven notes, and restrict your improvising to those seven notes, and you realize that it's not a question of so much of, of, of chasing chords, it becomes a question of, harmon of, of melodic invention. Melodic invention. When I listen to chant as a jazz musician, I find myself intrigued with how, how the, they take the structured notes and embellish them to create these beautiful, beautiful melodies. Well, jazz musicians do the same thing. They do the same thing, as Father Coloma did say. One of the leading jazz musicians of, of that particular time was John Coltrane, the saxophonist John Coltrane, who happened to also be on that record of Kind of Blue with Miles Davis. Well, he buried himself in the New York City Library for a really a quite long period of time, and he studied the modes, studied the ancient modes, and he came up with a way of playing, and it was mode playing, and it revolutionized jazz. I can remember as a young man coming here to Louisville back in the 60s, when that was still happening, and playing at Jamie Abersall's house, and, I, and I'd go there and say, what are we going to play, Jamie? And he'd say, well, let's just play D Dorian for a while. That's one of the modes. And so we had to learn how to do that. And the way we learned to do it, as is always the case with, with musicians, we learn by hearing. We learn by listening. The, the true art of the music is handed down orally, not visually. It's all handed down orally. It's through the sound of music. So we're going to play something for you right now that, uh, that Coltrane, John Coltrane wrote. It's called Afro Blue. And uh, I want, also wanted to bring up one other point too, and it had to do with, uh, with, with uh, the subject of racism. And uh, Merton was, you know, as a young man, he was in, as I said, he was up in Harlem, and you know, in those days, they were black clubs. They, they did have a few clubs that white people went to, and they called them black and tan clubs. Some of you might remember those days. Uh, and, rec and, and black musicians recorded music 
But they were released, and they, uh, they, they were called, as when they were released, they were called race records. And people had to buy them under the counter. They were sold under the counter in record stores. They were given in, and put in paper bags. So you, that, was, that was where the mentality of the country was at that time. So music always, particularly with jazz, jazz always reflects the, 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 the things, uh, the, the, uh, the issue of the times, what's going on in society. Coltrane was a product of that, of the whole civil rights movement. All you have to do is listen to his music, and you'll see it, particularly one recording called Alabama, and it'll break your heart when you listen to it. So we're going to play something right now. This is called Afro Blue by John Coltrane.
funny thing happened in the 60s. All of a sudden, we people on the chant side decided to write things not in Latin, but in English. And Thomas Merton gets caught in the middle of all this because at Gethsemane and at my house in St. Michael across the Ohio River, we're both busy trying to do chant in English. And we're busy writing things and putting things together. It's talk about a messy period. But it's like being in the kitchen cooking up Thanksgiving dinner, I think. So we had the same thing going in both houses. And I'll give you from my perspective, and I'm sure it reflects what Thomas Merton had. There were problems if you applied the Ward method to writing in English. I'll give you an example of a piece I wrote, and we'll do it first in the Ward method equal note value. It's uh, an anthem taken from the funeral liturgy in seventh mode, and I believe you people are going to do something more in that area too. But we. Um, We'll do it first, and then we'll do it the way I would rather have it done, and then, I'll, and then I'm going to give you a quote from Thomas Merton. But first, let's listen to that. Uh, 
introit done now in English. Today a child is born for us. Today a son is given to us. How our authority now rests upon his shore. I became a novice at St. Minor in the year Bertrand died in 1968. Uh, and I had met Columba before that when I was in our college. And over and over again, had we, we had heard so much that chant was the precursor of jazz. Tonight, finally, we got to do jazz and chant together. Now, you were in a historical situation. I don't think anywhere there's ever been a jam, chant and jazz combination. We called it Jant. <laughs> it's a Jant concert, or a Chaz concert. That's what they would say in Chasper, Indiana, where they have the Germans. <laughs> anyway, when, when, when Nessa called and said, are you interested in doing this? All I could think of was Columba for years been telling us that Jant and Chaz are kissing cousins. And I think it's just been marvelous to work with Chuck and the group and in our community. Uh, uh, to, to pr pr produce something like this, and uh, it's a real privilege and pleasure uh, to do it tonight on the anniversary of Merton's death. Um, what we're going to end with is a demonstration of just how that can work together. Uh, every Sunday in our Vesper liturgy, in the evening uh, prayer, we sing a canticle from the book of Revelation, and we've done the Christmas uh, music, the poor not just us today, a child is born. Uh, and this is something that comes from the book of Revelation. And what we're going to do is sing the chant. It's very melismatic, very uh, developed. Uh, and then the ensemble is going to improvise after each verse. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Salvation and glory. Oh, 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 oh,
Thank you for joining us for this wonderful evening performance. They all did a wonderful job, and I, I love what Father Jeremy said that he was excited to get to get together. And as someone who has come from the wonderful Jasper area, I chuckled at what you said because they do speak like that. We're chased under jackets. But with that, thank you so much for coming, and have a wonderful rest of the.